Okay, um, excellent. Well, welcome everyone to this IES webinar, An Introduction to Contaminated Land Investigation and Remediation. We're delighted today to be joined by Luke Bradley. Um, Luke has been a geo-environmental engineer for over a decade, working at a range of environmental consultancies and remediation contractors. During this time, Luke has covered a wide range of projects in the public, commercial and housing sectors, including power stations, schools and railway schemes. His experience also includes the design and scoping of remediation projects and verification of completed remedial work. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be made available on the IES YouTube channel. Thank you so much for presenting today, uh, Luke, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ethne. Um, so as he says, my name's Luke. I'm going to give you a, as brief an introduction to contaminated land uh, as I possibly can. Um, I'll start with an introduction about myself. Um, I have a BSc in environmental geoscience, um, but people in our field also have degrees in geography, environmental science, environmental management, all sorts of different things. Uh, I'm currently principal environmental consultant for a company called Soilutions based in Edinburgh. Um, and I do this job because I love being outside and I love the environment. Um, it's how I ended up in Scotland um, and interacting with the environment for fun and for work is, is a really satisfying way for me to make a living. I'm going to cover five different areas. Um, we'll start with brownfield land, which is sort of the background to, um, to most contaminated sites. So this presentation is going to be couched in terms of brownfield land, but contaminated land investigation will also apply where there's been some other environmental incident. Um, I'll talk about the advantages of developing a site that is contaminated and the disadvantages. I'll have a very, very brief look at government policy um, before talking about site investigations. Um, my presentation today will cover the basics of contaminated land investigation. Human activity has been contaminating soil and water for centuries, and predominantly since the Industrial Revolution. This contamination can pose risk to the environment and to human health. And so investigations are carried out to determine what level of risk exists. The first point to cover is what is brownfield land, because brownfield land is the source of almost all contamination. Most contaminated land investigations will be carried out when someone developing a brownfield site goes through the planning system. And the local authority will note that the site was formally developed, it was a brownfield site, and request a contaminated land investigation to make sure future residents and the environment around that site aren't harmed. Um, in terms of brownfield land, I'm going to discuss what is brownfield land. It may seem obvious, but there's a few little nuances that need to be discussed in terms of contaminated land first. So the main two types of development site are greenfield and brownfield. Um, greenfield is undeveloped. Brownfield land has been developed before, and it sounds simple enough. So first, what is brownfield land? It's any land that has previously been developed by people. In terms of planning law, brownfield refers to sites that are vacant or derelict, so out of use. Um, this image here is a pub in London that closed in the 1990s and was going to be redeveloped, which is sort of a, a perfect example of a brownfield site. Brownfield sites are often contaminated by whatever they were formerly used for. This can be in several forms that impact soil quality, human health, and the water environment. In some cases, the contamination may also affect the air. Uh, for example, this, this pub here, the soil underneath that site was contaminated with what was essentially pure white spirit, and that was pumping out vapour that was building up inside this building, making the air unsafe to breathe. Brownfield sites tend to be industrial, but some sites can be former housing sites where the housing has fallen into disrepair. Crucially though, brownfield sites may not look like brownfield sites. So this is an aerial photograph of um, the edge of Peterborough uh, in the English East Mid Midlands. It looks a nice and clear cut. In the top of the shot is brownfield development in the form of housing and industry. And in the center of the shot is greenfield. Or is it? Here is um, another um, site in Peterborough. Um, you've got on the left of your screens a nice lake, some open woodland, some open fields. Um, but if I overlay this with a historic map, you can see that this site used to be um, 
a brickworks with kilns, a well, um, pits, old railway lines, um, all sorts of industrial activity going on there that while it appears today like a nice, clean, green site, could be contaminated with all sorts of things. Uh, there we go. So the, the UK has been industrial for hundreds of years, so there's plenty of brownfield sites around. So why are people still building on green fields? There are advantages to building on brownfield sites, but there's disadvantages too in terms of contamination that I'll discuss briefly now. There are plenty of upsides to brownfield sites that make developers choose them over green fields, which are greenfield sites are nice and easy to develop on in the main because there's not been anything there before. The sites are cheaper to buy, which offsets the extra cost of developing them. They're also usually in city centres, so more desirable, um, which means developers can cut, charge more. And brownfield development can regenerate local communities. <clears throat> so if an area is derelict, um, full of industrial buildings that have been left, they become rarely visited or even dangerous, but redevelopment can turn this around. So councils are pushing for redevelopment on brownfield sites. And finally, um, development on brownfield land is much more sustainable. There's no loss of green habitat or uh, green space or habitat, and developers are obliged to clean up any contamination under them. In terms of sustainability, um, here are some of the examples of the advantages of building on a brownfield site of greenfield. So habitats are less left intact, so important habitats for plants and animals aren't disturbed or damaged. In some cases, with the building of parkland on brownfield sites, redevelopment can improve biodiversity. Crucially, in terms of contaminated land, if a site has been contaminated, cleaning that up protects groundwater used for drinking, it protects surface water in the environments in that, and that has a positive impact on river quality and aquatic life. Um, it also has um, benefits for human health by removing contaminants, you're improving soil quality, making it suitable for growing food. It also encourages subterranean life like worms and fungi. Um, there is some discussion of whether replacing old buildings with more energy efficient ones is a sustainable option. Personally, I don't believe in that. I think if you are building a new building, it's always going to be less environmentally friendly than keeping an old one up to a point. Um, there's many other reasons, but I'll end on the fact that by not building on the edge of a city or out in the countryside, driving distance, distances tend to be reduced and hopefully public transport links are better. So there are all sorts of advantages to building on a site that might be contaminated, which is how we end up investigating them. There are some issues um, and it is predominantly um, the introduction of contamination into the ground by whatever was there before. Um, this can cost an awful lot to clean up. In some cases, it's only a few thousand pounds, but it can run to hundreds of thousands. Um, the cleanup, which is called remediation, must meet the requirements of several pieces of legislation. To give you an idea of the cost, in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency has set aside three and a half billion dollars to clean up 40,000 sites as part of uh, some of their legislation called the Superfund. Um, in addition, things will come across in, uh, in contaminated land investigations that don't necessarily relate directly to contamination. We'll also come across di difficult building conditions, um, and all of that presents unknown costs to a developer. Part of that cost is the requirement for an investigation, usually stipulated by the council. Um, and greenfield sites are often seen as easier to build on and in better locations. There is also some sort of disconnect between where the demand for new development is and where the sites are. Much of Britain's industry was in the north of England and central Scotland, um, where there is unfortunately less demand for housing. There is much more demand for housing in London and the southeast, where brownfield sites um, on the massive scale that they are in, in the north of England and southern Scotland are rarer. So moving on to contamination, um, contamination appears in a few different um, a few different forms, um, all of which can be the main developer uh, barrier to developing a brownfield site. Um, it can affect the soil, groundwater, surface water, 
um, but can also produce gas and vapours, um, which is something that doesn't seem that obvious um, to, to people not familiar with contaminated land. So to give you an idea of where this contamination comes from, here's a picture of a biscuit factory um, in Edinburgh. So a biscuit factory doesn't sound that contaminative. Um, biscuits are not, um, for example, a chemical works. Um, they aren't pumping out huge amounts of oil during their production. But even a site that seems relatively innocuous like this can have contamination associated with it. The chimney in the middle of that site and the pile of coal indicates that burning has happened. Where burning occurs, hydrocarbons can appear in the soil beneath the site. Um, some of these hydrocarbons are carcinogenic. Um, they can cause various other health issues, including uh, difficulties for fetal development. Um, and they are really common wherever there was a furnace in the middle of a factory. Um, but furnaces have also been present at schools for heating, for example. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a big factory that is the source of, uh, of contamination. There's a railway there. That's the source of asbestos from the brakes of locomotives. Sitting locomotives would have dropped oil and ash and possibly fragments of metal out of them into the ground beneath, uh, beneath them. The factory itself has machinery in it. So while it is only producing biscuits, they will have been using lubricating oils in the machines. Uh, the machines might have had shards of metal coming off them over time, um, all of which would eventually end up in the ground if, um, if it somehow got outside. Then the building itself. If this building contains asbestos um, or fragments of metal that are not handled correctly during demolition, all of that can contaminate the ground when the building is taken away. Finally, it's quite hard to see here, but the railway line is slightly raised up relative to the building. Ground that's been raised up um, is called made ground, and there could be almost anything in there. It was often cheapest to raise up ground with waste from foundries, um, anywhere that produced a large amount of ash. And so you will have a significant depth of ash and brick and demolition material that has been bought um, cheaply to, write, to build up land and is then introducing contaminants into an area. So there are a few other sources of contamination burning, which produces hydrocarbons and in some cases metal. Machinery produces metal fragments and drops oil or grease. The storing of fuels, oils or acids or other harmful substances, if they weren't stored correctly, they can end up in the ground as well. Using waste ground material to raise ground is, uh, is a fairly significant source of contamination. Um, but also handling harmful materials like pesticides or working with metals. Um, one relatively common um, contamination source I've been dealing with lately is sheep dips, um, which are full of pesticides, which have been spread around by poor handling, the nature of sheep dips where a river will run through, um, through the site, um, and the water from the river will sluice into the sheep dip and back out, um, and those pesticides can be um, really persistent. So I'll briefly discuss um, what contamination ends up where. Um, metals and hydrocarbons can seep into the soil as it rains. Um, any ash from the furnaces in the factory um, will be dumped outside. They'll mix with soil as people and vehicles move over it, and that will add metal and hydrocarbons. Uh, when the railway in that picture was raised, man-made soil containing ash, metals, chunks of concrete uh, and brick, like in the, the soil in this picture, will have been used. The main risk in terms of contaminated soil, uh, as far as planning is concerned, is to human health. Levels of metals like lead and arsenic and hydrocarbons are potentially toxic. As people work in gardens or work on water pipes or work on construction sites, they will touch the soil and contamination will pass through their skin. Um, scientists have calculated how much soil will stick to someone's skin in a day and what amount of contamination is safe to be present in soil before it will cause harmful levels in, uh, in skin and blood cells. Bits of contaminated soil can attach to homegrown vegetables and then get eaten. Um, children, children may eat soil. Um, 
your average child will eat it in relatively small amounts, but there are health conditions where children have urges to eat quite significant amounts of soil. Um, soils contaminated with hydrocarbons can give off harmful vapours, and these can be inhaled and cause illness. Some contaminants may also be mobilised as rain or groundwater moves through it, and that will contaminate the groundwater beneath the site. And if the groundwater reaches surface water, then you've contaminated a stream or a river. Finally, there are some contaminants like sulfites, um, which, are actually, which can damage concrete and break it down. And um, this picture here shows selenite crystals, which occur naturally. Uh, they're very common in the London clay in the southeast of England. And they pose a risk to foundations in, in London if they aren't um, built with the correct concrete. Groundwater is also a major recipient of contamination. If contaminated soil sits beneath the water table, any contaminants which are capable of dissolving or moving in groundwater will mobilise. And rainwater can move contamination down through from dry soil to groundwater. That risks drinking water supplies, um, particularly in the southeast of England, where a great deal of drinking water comes from an aquifer. Um, a contamination of groundwater in that area could be particularly harmful. As groundwater moves, it will reach streams, rivers, or the sea, and that poses other risks. Um, so surface water can then be impacted. Um, contamination can reach surface water very easily. It can simply wash over the ground um, after rainfall straight into a stream or a river. This can harm aquatic life. Um, same pollutants that are toxic for humans are likely to be toxic for fish and animals living by the water. And it can also impact bathing quality. Um, there's been all the concerns this year about sewage um, being pumped into the sea. There are plenty of other contaminants that end up in uh, in the sea as well as a result of um, contaminated ground. Finally, um, a less obvious type of contamination is ground gas and vapours. A lot of man-made ground and landfills contain organic material that rots, it breaks down, and that can give off carbon dioxide, methane, and a few other uh, gases. Coal mines can also give off carbon dioxide. Um, this can build up inside buildings, and it might make people unwell. In the outdoors, this isn't such a risk because the gas will dissipate. But in a building with closed windows and doors, the air mix can be altered by ground gas. Um, one of the big cases in the contaminated land industry at the moment um, is this housing estate near Edinburgh, which was built over a coal mine. Um, but it had to be demolished almost immediately after it was built because people were collapsing inside their homes. Um, methane gas can also explode. Um, so this is a house that exploded in Derbyshire in the 1980s. Um, the pilot light on a boiler ignited um, and gas from an adjacent landfill had built up inside this building and the methane exploded. Um, that landfill was several hundred metres from the site um, and travelled through natural geology. Vapours like the smell you get from petrol can pose similar risks where there is hydrocarbon contamination in the ground. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, there is legislation and government policy in place to manage and encourage the use of brownfield sites. So I'll take a very, very brief look at um, the main government guidance that we use in the contaminated land industry. The, this is called the, the Land Contamination Risk Management Guidance. Uh, it gives guidance on how to manage the risk from contaminated land, and it tells you how to investigate it. Uh, this came out last year, it was an amendment to a very similar set of guidance uh, called CLR, CLR 11. It says that investigations should be carried out in three phases. Um, they have stage one, stage two and stage three. And as we'll see in the next section, we have phase one, two and three reports, but they don't quite line up with the LC ARM stages. The guidance also details how to plan remediation if unacceptable risks are identified and how to prove that any remediation work has been a success. So the legislation says that developers must identify and clean up any contamination at a brownfield site that poses a risk. So how did they go do about doing this? They must carry out a site investigation to test for contamination and gases in the soil and water beneath and around a site. This will be done in line with the LCRM guidance from the previous page. And it's worth noting that LCRM doesn't apply in Scotland specifically. 
but is used by most contaminated land specialists as its most detailed and thorough guidance. I'll briefly summarize why we carry out these investigations. Principally, it's required by law. If a developer is um, developing a site, they will be legally required to investigate um, potentially contaminated land. Um, brownfield sites, as I said earlier, have often been used for industry. So there is a risk of contamination in the ground, posing a risk to future users of the site and the environment around it. And the site investigation must identify what sources of contamination are at the site and how they pose a risk to the environment. The first stage is a phase one investigation, also called a death study. Um, if any of you are starting out in a career in contaminated land, this sort of report um, is likely to be your bread and butter. Um, it's the preliminary stage of the risk assessment, uh, which develops a theoretical model of the contamination at the site. It's a report produced using existing information. Most people will visit a site to produce this report, but it isn't a necessity. You will review old maps, data from the government and other sources like the fire service, who have records of fuel tank locations, and it will show the history of the site. For example, without a phase one investigation, it would be impossible to know that the green fields I showed you in Peterborough earlier were a brickworks. From this data, the level of sources of contamination, uh, the location of sources of contamination can be identified. And we can also see what will be impacted by the contamination. For example, if there's a source of ground gas, but no source of water contamination, we know there isn't a risk to the water environment, but there is a risk to human health. Once we know these sources of contamination and what will be impacted by it, we can design an on-site investigation to see if that theoretical um, source of contamination poses a real risk. The next stage is the phase two, which is the on-site investigation or the ground investigation. A consultant will visit the site, collect soil and groundwater samples, and probably monitor ground gases. Those soil and water samples will be analysed in the laboratory for heavy metals, hydrocarbons, and potentially other contaminants like pesticides. Once those results come back, the government has published safe levels of most contaminants that we would commonly come across, and the lab results will be compared to those to see if there is a risk of harm. If there is a risk of harm, the phase two will state that remediation is required to remove those, uh, the risk to the receptors. Um, this is a brief list of some of the things we'll be looking at for during an, an investigation. And if we find any of those at harmful levels, we will move on to uh, phase three. Um, this um, is called the remediation strategy. Um, and it's a design for how to clean a site. There are many ways to clean a site, removing soil to landfill, injecting chemicals which break down hydrocarbons or metal compounds, uh, use concrete uh, or other binders to lock contamination in place, um, or we can pump contaminated groundwater out of the ground and treat it. The remediation strategy will determine which of those options is the most suitable, practical, effective and long lasting, um, and it also has to be cost effective. Some of the chemicals that we use can break down hydrocarbons for many years. The strategy will also consider which option is most cost effective. Um, a method which isn't perfect, but is affordable, is better than one which removes all contamination, but won't happen because it's too expensive for the development to be viable. The phase three will also include testing once the remediation has been completed to prove that it has worked. If a site is going through planning, the local authority will want to see proof that the site is now safe. Uh, you can't simply do some remediation, say, oh, it's fine, I've done the remediation. You, you need to do further testing, further work to prove that it's okay. Um, so once that phase three is complete, specialist contractors can set about remediating the site to make sure it's safe. Um, the remediation work is classed as stage three under LCRM. Um, the main aim of the remediation is to leave the site suitable for use in accordance with brownfield policy. This means the aims will vary depending on what the development is, who will be using the site and what environmental receptors are around the site. For example, a housing development will need to have lower levels of contamination uh, because kids playing in back gardens, people growing vegetables, 
than an industrial estate where people aren't interacting with the soil. The ultimate aim will always be to reduce contamination levels or stop them reaching a receptor like people or a river. Um, and usually the aim is also to prevent future contamination. So this picture shows a fuel tank that had been removed from contaminated soil. There was no point treating the contamination in the soil without removing the fuel tank um, because the fuel tank was the source of the contamination. It would just recontaminate that cleaned up ground. There's a few different methods um, for cleaning up a site. I'll talk about a few of them here. Um, source removal is perhaps the simplest option. So as with that fuel tank I showed you uh, a couple of slides ago, removing a source can prevent a problem in the future. With a fuel tank, it's a nice simple solution. However, it often means dig and dump, which is simply ex excavating contaminated soil and throwing in a landfill. In Scotland, a third of what goes into landfill is soil. Um, we have a slightly different tax regime up here, which means that it is cheaper to do that than it is to remediate a site um, with, uh, with on-site methods. It's easy for contractors to do and the results are immediate, but it's not sustainable. Um, so for example, to dig out the contamination around the fuel tank in this picture, um, that took 40 lorries driving 160 miles each and two excavators to, to carry out that work. And it all went to landfill. One of the on-site alternatives would be chemical treatment. Uh, chemical oxidation is the most common option. Um, this uses hydrogen or calcium peroxide to react with hydrogen and hydrocarbons and break them down by creating water and carbon. This method will treat soil and water, but it just takes several months. It can require several treatment rounds and there is uncertainty about the results, but it will work for, for several months or even years in some cases. Bioremediation is a popular method for treating hydrocarbons. It's one we get asked about a lot. It uses bacteria and fungi, um, which use hydrocarbons as a food source. They will then remove hydrocarbon contamination from the soil. You can do this in a few ways, by biostimulation, which increases the amount of microbes in the soil which eat hydrocarbons. Um, you can do that with chemicals or nutrients. Alternatively, you can use bioaugmentation, um, which adds new microbes to the soil to remove the contamination. Uh, again, this will keep working for months, um, but can work for keep working for years. But before we finish, I'll quickly talk about some potential future elements of contaminated land investigation and remediation. In Denmark, contaminated land consultants are now obliged to test for certain microbes, which are known to cause illness. Um, the reason for this is because there are some studies suggest that some microbes in contaminated soil and contaminated water are developing antibiotic resistance um, by living in that contaminated ground and being exposed to heavy metals and other things that are present in antibiotics. Um, crucially, they've never been exposed to an antibiotic. Um, and Denmark is just building up uh, a database um, to see what microbes are, uh, are present and which ones are, are going to pose a future problem. At the moment, there isn't particularly a solution to it, um, and they don't expect these microbes to be remediated. Um, they are just building up that database. But it poses a question of how will we remediate a microbe that is resistant to the main thing intended to kill it? There are other new and emerging contaminants. Uh, PFAS is the main one that our industry is talking about at the moment. These are a so-called forever chemical. They've been found in the blood of 97% of Americans. Um, they are used in all sorts of plastics, clothing. Um, they are pretty much everywhere. They can cause health issues, but we're only just beginning to investigate for them. And new contaminants will, will emerge um, in future all the time. Um, and I suspect we'll be cleaning up contaminated land for thousands of years to come. Finally, there are new remediation techniques being developed all the time to keep up with those new contaminants, but also to reduce costs and give alternative methods. Smouldering is a new method being developed in Scotland that heats soils gently, um, which can break down longer chain hydrocarbon contamination like lubricating oil. Uh, in that uh, situation, soil is placed in a container and heated before being tested and put back in the ground. Uh, unfortunately, that's 
is likely to be expensive uh, and is still at the experimental stage. Um, that ends my presentation today. Hopefully that's been a good summary of why there is contaminated land, why we have to deal with it and how we deal with it. Um, and feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Luke, for that comprehensive um, overview of contaminated land investigation. That was really, really interesting. Um, and I've already seen that we've got some questions uh, coming through. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I'll kick off with the first one now, Luke. Um, so about the types of contamination of brownfield land, vapour and gases uh, were mentioned. Um, how do these indices of contamination, how can they be identified and measured in as much as these identified contamination types are not localised, but could be spatially distributed even to areas that are not on the brownfield site? So the first thing that we'll do during the phase one report is identify potential sources in the area. Uh, so the house that I showed you where there was an explosion, the landfill for that was several hundred metres away. Uh, a contaminated land consultant would have picked that up. Um, unfortunately, if we are looking at a single development, contaminated land consultants are restricted to testing sort of within the site boundaries unless there are exceptional circumstances. We test for these gases by drilling boreholes in the ground and storing rolling a well in them. These wells are a plastic pipe with slots in it that lets gas and groundwater pass through. The pipes are sealed at each end with a tap on the top, and we have specialist monitoring devices that we can plug into that tap, and that will give us an instant reading of what percentage of oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, and some other gases are, uh, are in that gas. We can also take gas samples from those wells um, and get them analyzed at the laboratory. Um, and then we compare them to some government guidance and we can design protection measures. Um, but now, unfortunately, we can't really give uh, recommendations for a wider area. We can only deal with the site that we're given. Thanks for that, Luke. Um, and um, moving on to the next question. Um, how long does it take for bioremediation uh, to be effective? <laughs> so. <laughs> It depends is uh, sort of as good an answer as I can give for most of the types of remediation. Um, in some cases, it can be relatively quick. It can take a few weeks um, or a few months. But if there is a large amount of contamination, if the soil conditions aren't right, um, then it can take several rounds of remediation, which can then run into years. Um, but a, a sort of typical site, I think we would be looking at possibly a year from start to finish for a bioremediation project. That's interesting, thank you. Um, and someone else here has a question related to phase two site investigation. Is there any specific criteria to identify the soil sampling location? Is there any grid size to be used, for example? Um, there are British standards and guidance which suggest a minimum spacing, and that varies depending on uh, the type of development uh, up to a point, um, but it um, there isn't a set grid spacing. Um, a housing development, usually something in the region of 20 meter spacing uh, is recommended. On some sites you will sample in a grid, but on other sites you may try and keep your sampling locations within 20 meters of each other, but focus on those sources of contamination that you'd identified in the phase one report. So if, for example, you have tanks dotted randomly about the site, rather than having a grid that misses those tanks, you would focus on those tanks and then take untargeted samples elsewhere on the site to give you a comparison to work with. That makes sense, thank you. Um, and in recent years, have you noticed a change in the demand for contaminated land or overall operation of the sector? You mentioned that there's a greater demand for homes and developments in the south, but there are more brownfield sites in the north. Has this negatively impacted the industry? Um, I wouldn't say that it has. Um, I I'm based in Edinburgh and still do a lot of work in London. Um, anywhere where there is development happening, there is a need for our industry. Um, and I can't say I've seen it tailing off. Um, we have noted a tailing off in the remediation industry in Scotland um, as a result of some tax law changes back in 2016. Um, so we are seeing less on-site remediation and more 
uh, sort of landfill. But on the whole, throughout the UK, um, I wouldn't say there has been a decline in our industry. It just keeps getting stronger and stronger as people more understand the, the problems of contaminated ground. Great, thank you. Um, and we've got another attendee here who's interested from an air quality perspective, in particular during the remediation phase. Um, clearly, HGB movements to take material off site are undesirable. But do you feel enough attention is being given to the health impacts on local residents from VOC releases from the on-site methods when being discussed at the option stage? Um, so the, the pub that I showed at the, at the start of this presentation, um, VOCs were the problem at that site. Um, and we were working inside the basement, digging up contaminated soil to be taken away. Um, it was stored inside the building in skips and then, and then moved on. Um, but we did get um, complaints from the local authority um, about concerned residents who had been uh, smelling the VOCs. Um, we monitored outside the site um, and found that there wasn't a risk. But there was an odor which obviously has an impact on people's lives. But in answer to the question, I would say that no, probably not. There are not, um, in that case, there was no stipulation from the council that we monitor outside until someone noticed a problem. And that is perhaps something that we can get better at. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, the crude oil impacted groundwater. Is there a workable remediation that can restore the water quality? Um, yes, um, there are a few different methods. If there is a really large amount of oil, on, uh, it will usually sit on top or beneath the groundwater. Um, oil and water obviously don't mix particularly well. And so in some cases, we are just able to pump that oil off separately um, and then take that away. Um, it can be recycled um, for use um, as other kinds of oil, lubricating oils and so on. Where oil has sort of mixed in with the water, the, um, those chemical treatments and bioremediation are effective at, at removing the majority of, of contamination. It's rare to remove everything, um, but we can make it safe. Right, thank you. Um, and you mentioned as one of the new methods for remediation, um, the, the heating of the soil. Um, but uh, does this predispose the soil to huge losses of microorganisms that would have played an important role in bioremediation and soil health? Um, and therefore, it, is it sustainable? Sorry. I can't answer that. Um, I have met the people developing this method a few times, and to be honest, that hasn't come up. Um, there is, um, if you were to search small green remediation, there are, I think, some of their papers online. Whether they've discussed that, I'm not sure. Um, I know that introducing um, chemical oxidation materials to the soil can be pretty bad for the microbes that are there. But similarly, usually if you're getting to that stage, the levels of contamination in that soil are already bad for the microbes. Um, essentially, contaminated land is not good for, for the soil in any shape or form. Great, thank you. Um, is it advisable to convert brownfield land to agricultural land um, where lands are the, is the limiting factor to food production? There are a few cases where I've seen this. Um, <laughs> It, it can work. Um, it usually involves um, a lot of new topsoil, um, but in some contact, some previous land uses, everything is already there. Um, usually in terms of if we do find contamination on, uh, on an agricultural site, it tends to be related to something small, like there used to be a foundry, a, a small, really small scale blacksmith in the corner of a site, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of large scale agriculture, I haven't seen it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Great, thank you. Um, and while you say there's no slowdown in, in the industry, do you think that there is an increase in the construction industry as a whole, not valuing the role of investigation and remediation and instead using the cheaper option? <laughs> yes. Um, Construction companies are obviously working to a budget um, and a contaminated land investigation remediation negatively impacts that. We also hold them up 
we they have to wait for us to finish the investigation remediation can take a long time um, and so we are often seen as an industry that is a hurdle to get over rather than a necessity to making higher quality soil cleaner groundwater safer environments um, we're often just a box to tick uh, for developers to get through planning uh, which is a shame um, I did some work on a site last year. I and another consultant were working together on um, designing some remediation for it. The easiest option was digging everything out, taking it to landfill, but we had come up with a cheaper option that would take a few weeks longer. The consultant and I had the day before watched a webinar about sustainable remediation and the drive for sustainable remediation, how this was going to be a, a massive thing in the industry and we should all be trying for it. And the day after we'd watched that, the developer said, oh, we don't really care that it costs less. It's harder for us. It's just easier to take it to landfill. So we do face problems. Um, and I'm personally, I'm not sure how we can overcome those. Thank you. Um, and noting that brownfield sites were left for an extended time may develop recolonization and on some sites have ecologically valuable habitats and species. How is remediation um, undertaken to mitigate loss of the, um, of the potential of this ecological value? Um, this, yeah, this is a question I've been asked before. Um, it is rare for a site that is seriously contaminated and needs serious remediation to be a valuable habitat. There are certainly many sites that have become valuable habitats over time, um, but certainly the majority of sites that I end up on, they are, still have hard standing on them. The majority of the vegetation tends to be things like buddleia growing through cracks. Um, a lot of them are not a great habitat um, and the redevelopment can sometimes create a better habitat with managed planting. Um, in terms of the remediation and its impact on habitats, it's not really something that we consider. All the habitat design, um, ecology design and so on is left to the developer um, and the planning authority should be approving their, their landscape design. So it sort of falls outside our scope. Amazing, thank you. Um, well, I'm so sorry if I didn't get to your question today. We've had loads of them coming through. Um, thank you so much, Luke, for your presentation and for answering all those questions. It's been um, really interesting and informative for attendees. Um, and I hope all the attendees really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you for logging in. Thank you so much, Luke, and to all of you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Very much.